Well, anyway, sorry. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, and I've got a couple of slides, so I am going to show, um, I am going to share my screen at some point, so I'll, I'll try that anyway and see if it, if it works. But thanks everyone for giving me the opportunity of talking on housing today. And also just to say, my internet connection does have a bit of a tendency to go very weak at times. So if it starts to break up, if someone could just, maybe Sheila, if you could just call out to me because I won't be able to, to tell obviously so you'll need to remind me and I'm using two screens which is why the camera is on me at some time but not the other. Um, anyway, um, I've worked for almost 20 years for the regulator of social housing uh, where I was also a trade unionist for most of the time. Unfortunately they did keep making me do a proper job at the same time um, but I, I, I spent a lot of time on trade union duties um, and I served as the branch secretary of the United Housing Workers branch for nine years um, and also helped found the Social Housing Action Campaign, which came out of um, the, the Housing Workers branch. The discussion tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the housing crisis, uh, particularly focusing on the social housing sector. I won't reel off tons of facts and figures because I can never remember them when people do that. But if you do want up to date information, there are some really good websites like Shelter, Homelessness Link and others. Um, and if you let me know if there's anything specific you're after, if you're going to be speaking on housing and you want some specific information, then just give us a nudge and I should be able to help you find where, where you can get the information. So. Obviously, as socialists, we can see from the start that there are always economic drivers for everything. Um, and comrades will know that the housing crisis is not new, but has been around for at least as long as the Industrial Revolution. It changes shape periodically. Um, and at the moment in England, the crisis is both chronic and acute. It's, the housing crisis is a generic term, really, but it has lots of subsidiaries, lots of different faces. It's got street homelessness, people in temporary accommodation like hostels, overcrowding, young people unable to afford to move out of their parental home until later in life than they have been in previous generations, people trapped in un uninhabitable or unsuitable homes, and rising mortgage defaults and rent debt levels, <clears throat> to name just some of the, the different facets. In fact, it's beginning to feel like the existence of the housing crisis has become normalised. It's become part of the landscape rather than an issue that warrants anything more than lip service from politicians and policymakers. As socialists, we understand that a capitalist economy is incapable of matching housing supply to housing need. Politicians are primarily from the 1%. Their landlords are beneficiaries of the profits of private housing development. They aren't interested in a greater equalisation of housing supply and demand. In fact, the Tribune recently referred to the UK government as government by landlords, saying around a quarter of all ministers, including Boris Johnson, collect rents, and around a fifth of all MPs are landlords. In 2017, research by The Guardian found that a third of councillors in England's rental hotspots are private landlords or own a second property. So you can see immediately why they don't want to have a, a landlord register um, and landlord, uh, private sort of tenants uh, uh, controls. Private developers, which include housing associations, will always tend toward, in a capitalist society, will always tend toward the most profitable forms of housing, which is why we have a glut of empty homes despite the acute shortage of affordable housing, truly affordable housing. Action on Empty Homes recently reported that over 600,000 homes in England are currently vacant, with 216,000 homes having been vacant for more than six months. The organisation also reported in April on the recent surge in long-term empty homes, arising second homes as investment vehicles and short-term lets through platforms such as Airbnb. After the Second World War, housing was less problematic because the Labour government invested in council house building. But since the 1980s, not enough homes were built for sale or rent at reasonable prices. Under the Thatcher government, council funding was cut and income from the sale of council homes through right to buy was redirected to the treasury, not retained by councils. Council's homes were also transferred to housing associations by, thousand, by the thousand through the large scale voluntary transfer project, the LSVT. And many of us warned at the time that this would just be the first step on the road to their complete privatisation. 
This is in fact what happened with many ending up privately owned and therefore for onward sale at market prices of massive profits or in the hands of large private landlords for renting at market rates, not social rents. Land banking exacerbates the problem. This is where developers have land and often already have planning permission but decide to leave it unde undeveloped because they believe its profitability will increase significantly over the next few years. In 2018, the Big Issue reported that the top 10 house builders have a staggering 633,000 building plots on their books. So these are plots of lands for estates, of which more than half have planning permission. This gives them, on average, eight years worth of capacity. In other words, if they didn't buy a single new plot of land, between them, the top 10 building firms could carry on building for eight years at current rates without ever running out of land. We can see the impact that this has had on tenure trends since the early 60s. And this is where I try and get a bit whizzy with the um, technology and um, share my screen. Okay, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So whoever's the host will have to change permissions to allow me, if that's okay. I'll be you, Mike. Uh, all right, right, sorry. Um, can I just do that on that one? <coughs> there it goes. <coughs> right, excellent. Okay, thank you. So the first slide is this one. Hopefully that's come up. But you can see uh, this is um, a percentage of families, single or couples, by housing tenure. So it's quite a good chart. I, I like this chart because I think it's a very vivid illustration. The social housing sector has shrunk. Has shrunk. Home ownership initially grew, but declined from peak and private rent Sorry. and now we need to housing us into 150,000 workers and have a collective surplus of around four billion pounds public perception is that housing associations remain true to their founding principles of providing good quality housing at rent levels considerably below prevailing costs and therefore accessible to the majority of working class people the reality now is starkly different. When we talk about housing associations, these organisations are no longer exclusively or even majority providers of social rented or affordable homes. So I'm going to go back to this chair. So we've got the next chart. And this shows the percentage change of stock type um, in one year, so 20, 2018 to 2019. What these charts show, there's another one as well, which I'll show in a minute, is that associations are increasingly focused on building for outright market sale and that they are gradually converting rented properties from cheaper to more expensive rent levels. And you can see it's quite a big difference. In 2019, property lawyer Savills noted that the amount of housing associations generated from new open market sales increased 16% from 221 million to a staggering 1.61 billion between 2016 and 2017. So that's the jump in just one year. You can see what a, a massive income booster it has been for the housing association sector. As associations become more focused on property development, I'll just show the next one as well. So that should be, there's this one as well, which shows it's quite, quite good because it shows the, the difference. So the general needs stock, um, low cost ownership is massively dipping and actually um, uh, that might well disappear altogether. Supported housing um, is disappearing, uh, and but you can see that the, there's a massive um, upward. Sorry, supported housing is going to disappear. There's a massive upward trend in low-cost home ownership. So this is really one of the areas where um, you know housing associations are are focusing. So stop share. That's the that's the last one of that. Um, uh, 
as associations become more focused on property development, they inevitably appoint board members with experience of finance, investment and construction. The Peabody Board, for example, has a total of 13 members plus the CEO. One is a tenant, one is a resident and just one of the remainder has no obvious ties with finance and investment companies. Of the rest, they have between them links to the London Pension Collective Investment Vehicle, financial services and energy sectors, planning and development, the global property advisory industry, this is from their own website, town planning, commercial building management, corporate finance, development fundraising and deal closure, infrastructure projects, PFI, the FTSE 100, a chief executive of the country's largest commercial property company and someone with ex extensive experience of complex real estate transactions and placemaking. And that's just the condensed version of their collective CV. What this trend produces for tenants is inadequate repairs and maintenance services, high rents and service charges and the cladding scandal. And I'm just going to develop that for a minute because this is a real rising issue um, in, in the sector. The deregulation of planning laws, which allowed developers to lawfully clad buildings in flammable materials. So this is what, what, what we're dealing with. One consequence is that thousands of occupants are now living in dangerous dwelling. Another consequence is the Grand, was the Grenfell fire. Inside Housing Magazine estimates that 600,000 people now live in affected tall buildings and millions more in medium rise towers. There's no real definitive number for how many people are affected by it. Housing associations are too rich to qualify for the government's remedial fund, but aren't prepared to use their reserves and surpluses for the work. When the law changes in the next year or so, housing associations intend to pass the bill for remedial work onto shared owners and leaseholders. But don't worry, the bill that any one household can be presented with will be capped at a mere £78,000. Even the first stage of assessing the fire risk of the cladding on all buildings has yet to be completed. A lack of qualified assessors means that it could take up to five years for the assessment to be completed. This means shared owners and leaseholders can't sell unless they find a cash buyer who isn't concerned about the risk of burning to death. The misery doesn't end there because housing associations have now implemented some measures such as working watch patrols at night, adding thousands of pounds to service charge bills. In one case, the service charge bill increased by more than a thousand percent to one thousand and 800 pounds per month per household. In conclusion, this is not a sector that has the capacity to solve the housing crisis. So how do we solve the housing crisis? In the longer term, the solution will be provided in a planned economy and actually the social housing sector points the way, I think. In this model, information is collected, which of the housing sector as it was points the way, um, information is collected which points to the type and location of housing need and develops accordingly, that invests in social housing stock, is carbon neutral, builds homes and addresses social problems. In the short term, our transitional demand remains for a mass council house building programme. However, it is possible to fight and win victories on housing and it is worth doing so because it makes such a massive difference to the people involved. This is an issue that I would argue the Socialist Party needs to become more involved in. There is no housing or anti-eviction movement at the moment, but it is coming. Because there are such high stakes involved, tenants and residents need to put a lot of trust in, the people, in people before they follow their advice on how to campaign on housing issues. This has really been our experience. It takes years to build that trust, and the more that we organise and lead the grassroots housing campaigning networks, the better place we'll be when the housing rises to the top of a resistance movement. So that's it from me. Thank you. Happy to take questions or comments. <laughs>